Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this week's virtual plant clinic. My name is Bill Lester. I'm with University of Florida Extension Service here in Hernando County. And here today, live in the office, Hi, in the studio, Look, is Lily yes, here. Yes. Because for so many weeks, either you've seen me on here or Lily and somebody else. Bernie. Bernie, yes. yes. We were thinking that maybe you thought that we were having an argument or something. <laughs> No, we haven't been. We've just had really bad conflicting schedules. So we're both here together in the same room live today for all of your lawn and garden and vegetable garden questions and water questions and which is a really good thing because to be totally honest, the political argument almost started, but then that thing hit go live. So, you know, we're done with that. <laughs> yes. This is Virtual plant clinic, so right. no politics here, <laughs> yes. no controversy about even invasive plants or anything else. Mm -hmm. We're more than happy to answer your questions. I'm a big believer in diversity of opinions and beliefs, so that's just great. But we try to keep the show family friendly. So, Good morning, Buddy and Monique. They were both here last week when you weren't. You were yes. spinning your palm. Well, yeah. I was on for a little bit. Yeah, you were. And I noticed that when I was watching it on my phone here, it looked great. Of course, so of course the it StreamYard did. feed. I was in it. Of course it did. Yeah, no, the, the video looked great. I could see all the comments. I put in a comment or two. So so this thing works really well, whether you're on a computer, a laptop, iPad, phone. And I'm sure most people use phones for this anymore. Good morning, Facebook user, whoever you are. <laughs> you're probably somebody we know, but when you're chiming in from Facebook, that's what it decides to call you. No, when you're watching on our Facebook group, uh, it shows me that you're a Facebook user. I don't know why that is. That's just a funny Facebook thing that we have to live with. So it's nothing personal. <laughs> Facebook did it, not me. And good morning, Lee. Or Cindy, sorry, Cindy. <laughs> Lee will be here shortly. <laughs> yes, yes, she will be. And uh, Facebook user is Wendy Rich. Oh, okay. Good morning, Wendy. How are you? And if Lee is on here, if you go ahead and chime in and let us know that you're here, because Lee sent me a picture of an insect pest on her eggplants last week after the clinic. And Lee lives down in Broward County. And it's a caterpillar. And the unusual thing is it's red. And I'm not used to seeing red caterpillars. I mean, it happens. It's just there's not really common caterpillar pests that are red. So I had to look into it, look it up. I actually sent the picture off to Lyle Buss, who runs the insect ID lab for University of Florida up in Gainesville on campus. And he said what he thought it was, although there's a possibility it could be a different species, which would be an invasive species not known to be in the U.S. or Florida. Oh, yet. super fantastic. So, <laughs> wow. good and bad. So we're good because it's it. interesting, and we may be the first ones to document it. Bad if you are a eggplant farmer, because then that's just another problem that you're going to have to deal with. Although, Cat Florida is home to a lot of... Um, new and fun and different invasive species just because you live in a greenhouse basically yeah so south florida gets all the new tropical invasive pests there's a huge amount of international um trade that goes through south florida between miami uh port everglades yeah. there's a number of different ports that, down there of ships um there's me um cargo hey good morning <laughs> how are you we're just yeah. talking about your little red caterpillars on your eggplants shipping crates oh, you know it's a small world and we intermingle a lot and uh you know we we move stuff around and you would not obviously you might know that they grow a lot of tropical plants down in south florida there's a huge nursery industry there but a lot of times they'll buy their plants they buy the little itty bitty starter plants that are started in foreign countries when i was in costa rica we were looking at a nursery where they had little starter plants, little cuttings that had rooted, and they had to very carefully wash all the soil off the roots before they shipped them to the U.S. 
because you can't send dirt into the U.S. It might have nematodes in it. So they have to wash all the soil off the roots. They're bagging it up. They're putting it in boxes. And I walked over in the corner to see where they were sending it to. It was going to a nursery in Apopka. So right. hmm. you would not believe how much, how many plants, cuttings and starter plants and potted plants and roses and cut flowers and everything that come here to South Florida and Central Florida from Central and South sure. America. And those are all possible yeah. ways to get nasty new things in here. Uh -huh. And then just the regular shipping, shipping, shipping from China, from other places, you know, just accidental, um, you know, riders, a lot of rattan furniture, you know, sometimes there's insects inside mm -hmm. of it. And, and something that came up just this morning, a gentleman brought in a little jar with some insects in it that he found in his brother's kitchen in his brother's house. And it turns out to be termites. We're gonna to have to take a closer look at them today to find out if they're dry wood termites or subterranean termites to give him guidance about whether he needs to call a professional or not. It's that time of year they're swarming. Huh? Yes, the subterranean termites are all swarming outside. If you go for a walk in the woods, maybe even in your backyard, they're coming out of an old stump. I've seen them swarm out of a pine cone before. So they're swarming. But it came up, he said that his brother buys a lot of used furniture from other people in their houses and brings it into his house. Oh my, yeah. That is not a good idea. Because if you go and you go to a yard sale or an estate sale and you buy a wooden chair, it could have possibly dry wood termites in it. There are... I just did that. How, how, I bought a chair from a thrift store. Uh oh. <laughs> did you take it straight in the house or did you make yeah. it? Oh, yeah. Uh oh. <laughs> um, somebody that we both know, his wife was in the habit of buying furniture like that for a thrift store, yard sales, and that. He would always make it sit in quarantine out in the garage. the garage or the barn for a week or two to make sure there were no pests inside of it. I wish I would have thought of that. Yeah, because if I do that when I've been traveling, um, I'll leave the suitcases in the garage for oh, a yeah. week or two. To, Mine and the dirty clothes go straight in the washing yeah, machine. Yeah, well, they're right next to each other, the garage and the laundry room. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, the, the clothes actually go straight in the washing machine, but I leave the suitcases and the stuff in the garage in the winter. I'm not as confident, <laughs> you know, but in the <laughs> summer, I know it's going to bake any kind of bed bugs or travelers that might have come along with it yes yeah, so you have to be very careful with that but used furniture can carry something called powder post beetles and what they do is they drill little holes in the wood and they kick out um sawdust basically and if you get them in your house they're controllable but they're a little tough to control it's not very common i've only heard about it once or twice i don't even have one in my collection yeah, I need to get on these exterminators to bring me more interesting insects for my collection. But it can happen. He's a serial killer. And the easiest way to get it is from used furniture. So be very, very careful when you get something used. Make sure it's completely clean before you bring it in the house. Okay. Ooh, I better go check that out. <laughs> Didn't even think about it. Furniture, refrigerators, TVs, things like that potentially can have German cockroaches in them also, oh, depending on where they came from. So just just a word of warning. Mm -hmm. Those are the nastiest things ever. Yeah, mm -hmm. and German cockroaches, you probably want to call a professional to get rid of. Just a can or a jug of spray spraying in the corners is not going to do it. Mm -hmm. You need to get on top of them and pull things apart and spray behind them, under them, inside of them and be really, really diligent to pretty, make sure they're gone. I've been pretty lucky with the baits, as long as you put them in the right place. And my husband actually had been in pest control before in one of his lives, so he knows all the hiding places where to put things. Um, we never had an issue until, well, you know what happens when, um, you know, kids leave and then they come back. <laughs> and they, Yeah, they bring all their stuff back. They bring all them. their stuff and they had lived in apartments. Uh oh, yeah, that's bad. Yeah, so but we got 
control of it right away. So made her get all every box that she brought in, get out, get it out of here. And you know, we um, worked on putting little little baits around, even like hidden up under the uh, dishwasher, things like that. But yeah, last you have summer. Have to get control of it immediately, though. Yeah, last summer I got a couple of Australian roaches, the big ones that people call palmetto bugs, mm -hmm. in my garage. Did and it say good day mate to you? No, <laughs> but part of the reason why they moved in and were so very, very happy, temporarily at least, is because we had a lot of cardboard in the garage. So I told my wife, we need to thin the cardboard and get rid of a bunch of it. It's just attracting these guys, and we'll never get rid of them if we keep all the cardboard. So we got rid of a bunch of cardboard. I got baits, and they make really good roach baits now. It comes in a big, fat syringe, mm -hmm. and just yeah. a little squeeze mm -hmm. back in the corner behind everything. I put a bunch out. Boom, the next day, it was gone. They gobbled it up. A couple days later, all the roaches were gone. Got rid of them very, very quickly. Didn't have to spray. Didn't have to endanger the dogs. Right. Just the bait back where nobody can get to it. Kids can't get to it. The dogs can't get to it. You know, a good place to take the switch covers off of your light switch and put some in mm -hmm. there and put that back. Yeah. I've done that before. Mm -hmm. So. Cindy says when her kids return from college, <laughs> nothing came in the house until examined and cleaned. Yes. Very, very important. And you need to be very thorough and diligent with that. But some things are unavoidable. Every once in a while, we'll get a case of some kind of weevils, and I've seen it in rice. I've oh, seen it sure. in dog Those food. Pan pantry pests. Yes. Pantry pests. And that's usually not your fault. No. It's you bought a bag of rice that was contaminated, a bag of dog food that something had gotten into either at the grocery store or usually the, the grocery warehouse. Or, and, you know, yeah, it's just they're in those grain type or yep. the rice type. You know, their eggs are there. And they've hatched. You just don't even know how <laughs> many bugs you eat. <laughs> and you, you don't, don't know, want to know. <laughs> and nobody knows they're in the rice until they hatch. And now you have all these little, maybe eighth of an inch long black weevils in it. Or the dog food, you go to pour a bowl of dog food and there's, you know, little weevils in it. They tend to be bigger weevils. We or a, there's a variety of beetles that like dog food or cat food, same thing. Just they're looking for grain. Mm -hmm. um, and we, years ago when I worked here at Extension, we would, you know, people would come in with these pantry pests. So we'd sit down with them to try and figure out where they were coming from. And you really do need to take everything out of your cabinet, rub your cabinet down in the crevices and everything with bleach water, you know. Um, Get, throw everything Clorox away. cleaning spray yes. will be your best friend. Uh, throw, you know, any kind of, you know, if it was a bag of rice or whatever, throw that away. Um, sometimes we would, a lot of times when there was no other answer, it was found in the animal food, the dog food, the mm -hmm. cat food, bird seed sometimes. Um, yeah, bird seed can get a lot of different insects that live in that seed when you buy it and the most interesting one i think is finally you know we had this man like walking mentally through his house to tell us what was there he had a wheaties collection with the wheaties still in the boxes oh, oh. from like the 80s the boxes are fine the wheaties that old is just all you can eat buffet for certain insects Yes. Oh, Cindy had some pasta. You know, one way you can avoid that is when you buy your pasta, put it in the freezer for a while mm -hmm. anyway, a couple, a week or two. And um, then you'll just eat those eggs and you'll never know they were there. <laughs> yeah. if, if there were eggs in it, I mean, this doesn't happen very often. We get, we don't get a lot of questions here. Only a couple of years. We used to more yeah. so. And my sister up north has a continual problem with it. And I think, you know, because those, you know, the houses are kept pretty warm you know, in the uh, winter up there. So maybe that encourages the, the hatching. I'm not sure, but. Yeah. yeah. And 
my guess is different grocery store warehouses are just more diligent about eliminating it at yeah. that point. Cindy says, ooh, um, Cindy's protein. I mean, I mean but it, yeah. there actually is a USDA percentage of um, insect parts. material that's allowed to be in your food because it's impossible to eliminate it all. It's there, but don't overthink it. Just put it back out of your head. Yeah. But what a lot of people do is when they buy pasta or flour or cornmeal or grits or something, they'll put it in a container in the freezer for a couple of days, pull it out, and basically anything that might have been alive in it is dead. Mm -hmm. And then it's safe to put in your pantry as long as it doesn't get recontaminated from in your house. Because right, right. when you get these things, you need to look through your pantry and... Like, I got it in rice once before, and I got oh, the yeah. little tiny rice weevils. I, I, I think everyone I know has had it mm -hmm. at some point. It's nothing to think that you're the most horrible, dirty person <laughs> in the world. It's just just something you got to deal with. And it's a northern and southern, you know, issue. It's wherever you have grains, there are certain insects that put their eggs in grains. And, I mean, that's that's what they do. So... Yeah, uh, certain ones prefer corn, and other ones prefer look flour. Like little moths in your pantry. Mm -hmm. Some of them grow up to turn into the moths, other ones grow into little beetles, and they're normally weevils. And they're really not that hard to identify, especially if you know what they were feeding on. Right. So, usually when people bring them in here, I just pull out my, I actually have keys for that also. And mm -hmm. we key them out and add it to the collection if I don't already have some. Teaching collection. He has a collection of dead things. Collection of insects. Through them and shows them off. Most of it is right here in the office today. Yeah. You're going to write some kind of horror story about today. <laughs> <laughs> so if anybody has any lawn and garden or vegetable garden or fruit tree kind of questions or palm tree questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. And we'll discuss them, and we'll try to come up with an answer for you. Bay leaves. Oh, oh. I wonder if that would help. Lee says she puts bay leaves in her rice and beans containers. They won't hurt. <laughs> it doesn't hurt. I can't say that that's going to be a really effective insect deterrent. I mean, it would keep maybe keep the live ones out. It's not going to stop any kind of eggs from hatching or anything. Bay leaves are an essential ingredient in good Cuban beans and rice, black beans and rice. There you go. So, so you already got it. So you know you're already partway there. <laughs> um, certain things, especially things that contain really strong scented oils, certain herbs, uh, possibly bay leaves, uh, different types of mint, cinnamon, can help to deter insects. But it only deters them. It doesn't kill them. It doesn't guarantee they're all going to go away and never come back. It can help. And normally, uh, it doesn't hurt. Like bay leaves in with your beans and rice. It's not going to hurt that. Right. Spraying, um, I've heard of cinnamon oil, spearmint. And then a lot of people believe in garlic and hot peppers and things like that. To grind that up in a blender, strain it, put it in a spray bottle, spray it on your plants. Probably will not hurt the plants. Yeah. How the effective it's going to be, I'm not really away. sure. Vampires will stay far away from it. Sure, it gets rid of the vampires. Yeah. Um, it will be effective for at least 24, 48 hours until you water or it rains. Rain is going to wash it right away. So generally, those aren't bad things, but they're probably very, very mixed as far as mm -hmm. how effective or successful they are. I've used cinnamon before in years past. Um, to deter ants on my kitchen counters. I had a very lovely smelling kitchen because I poured literally just the cinnamon from the spice, bottle, uh -huh. like all in all the creases and cracks in my <laughs> counters. Well, I saw that Facebook thread and I saved it. I got it in my computer somewhere. Oh, you have a picture of you with a huge thing. Of I know. I, I Well, I, that's a separate picture. I, I don't think I ever posted that. It might have been taken the wrong way if I did. But it was somebody asking a question about their St. Augustine lawn and there's big oh, dead yeah, spots and what's wrong. And then there's like a hundred responses on there. And people are suggesting this and that, most of which are wrong. A few people suggested um, 
What's the other disease that St. Augustine gets in the winter? They suggested that, which was incorrect. Gray and leaf if, spot? No, a few people said maybe gray leaf spot, but that never gets bad enough where it's really noticeable, makes dead, dead areas in your lawn. So a few people suggest to take all root rot, which is probably the correct answer, and put links to the University of Florida fact sheet Ooh, on that. Go people, yay. And somebody else said that you can use cinnamon. And cinnamon does have very mild antifungal properties. But in your lawn? They said you can use cinnamon in your lawn. And I'm thinking, Ooh. how much cinnamon would it take to treat your lawn with and it's probably going to be very ineffective at actually getting in control of the fungus and getting rid of the outbreak. It most likely won't hurt anything. I don't think that cinnamon is going to damage turf grass. It's not poisonous to it or anything. No, but you'll have neighbors over looking for cookies. <laughs> no, I'm thinking you would have the best smelling lawn in the neighborhood. Everybody would be like, oh boy, French toast. Who's having French toast? And it was just... If you post a question on Facebook, you will get every comment and answer imaginable. Which leads us to classes that we have coming up. Um, when are we doing it? March, I think this is the second and third Wednesday in March. Um, oh, he put a calendar up. <laughs> <laughs> this is my calendar, okay. yes. <laughs> so we're doing it, what, the 16th and 23rd? So it's the third and fourth? Yes, six, March 16th and March 23rd. We are doing a series on um, Florida gardening mythology. And we're going to discuss, a lot of it will be answers that you find when you ask questions on Facebook. <laughs> we're not saying don't ask, but go to the right place to ask. It would smell beautiful, yes. Um, you know, Bill has a extension uh friends of extension website where he will probably answer your questions our facebook group yes. yes there's a master gardener group there's groups out there um you know just even extension groups or you know native gardening groups something like that too but ask the right place your neighborhood generalized group <laughs> is not the place to ask, or unless you want to give us a good time looking at all the answers. We're not gonna weigh in there. No, that is a, uh, you know, we're not even gonna start with that. <laughs> but what we'll do is take some of those wild and crazy answers and uh, have classes about them and tell you the, you know, what will, what won't work. Kind of. Yeah, I'll have to dig up that thread for the class because just a few days after that, we had to go shopping at Sam's, and Sam's does have the large containers of cinnamon. So I still have a picture of myself holding up the great big container of cinnamon. I'm thinking, how many of these do you need to treat your lawn with? So when you ask a question on a random Facebook gardening group, you'll get 100 responses. Five of them are correct. All the rest are not correct. But which ones are correct? You may not really know. And people love the idea of, all natural, sure. organic, sustainable, yeah, safe. And some of it might work, but some of it mm -hmm. is just a waste of, you know. Yeah, and that cinnamon <laughs> wasn't wasn't free, that's for sure. And I don't know yeah. how much you have to spend on a whole bunch of cinnamon. Mm -hmm. um, and cinnamon does have very slight antifungal properties. For anybody who grows orchids, they'll usually, when they take a cutting of an orchid, dust it in cinnamon powder not cinnamon sugar but cinnamon powder and it does help with reducing diseases on that cutting when they put it in but it's not a very very strong it's not really strongly effective it doesn't hurt anything it's a little it bit effective your lawn, it's just gonna, we're gonna, it's gonna <laughs> rain and then you'll have cinnamon water coming out of your lawn <laughs> yeah uh, what does that do in the groundwater i wonder i don't think anybody's ever looked at that one <laughs> Probably doesn't get that far. Let's see. Okay, and going back to the bugs, Lee says she hasn't seen bugs in her kitchen. That's good. And she does put pasta in the fridge until she's ready to cook it. So that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. um, either refrigerated or frozen for 24, 48 hours, that's all it takes. Right. But and keeping then, it in the refrigerator keeps it at 40 degrees where they're they're not going to uh, hatch at that temperature. And it's it's... 
enclosed and safer than in your pantry where other things could be coming and going and you buy a bag of flour and plunk it in there and now stuff in it has contaminated everything in your pantry. Oh, here's an interesting question. Cinnamon, I assume. Cinnamon. Cindy wants to know, will cinnamon attract bees? Not as much as sugar would. But <clears throat> it I might attract no wasps. I have no idea. <laughs> well, maybe we should run an experiment. Put yeah. some cinnamon out in your yard and see if, <laughs> what you attract. Or that'd be a great science fair project. For you know, that would be. Yeah. That would be a Let's very go good next, one. I'm going to go next door and tell Nancy, the 4 H agent. Yeah. Uh, no, it, for. To pass that on to her kids. <laughs> for a high school science fair. Yeah. Um, if you find a lawn that has St. Augustine grass and take all root rot, and you could even replicate that, get a few pieces of sod and inoculate it with it. You know, we can help you oh, get yeah, a hold of even, some. Don't even need to do that. You, um, you can find it. It's not that hard to find here in Hernando County, at least. And then inoculate a couple plots, have your control plot, have one with cinnamon, <clears throat> have one without, I don't know, and, you know, run, mm -hmm. run the experiment that way, see if cinnamon actually has any kind of impact. And it might. It's just probably not going to be effective enough to make it cost worthy and time worthy although it would smell nice <laughs> yes. so, yeah that's a good question so if you tune in for our upcoming classes um we will i'll have to try to dig out some of the wackiest questions and misconceptions oh, yeah. i've ever run We're across gonna have to start also before. looking at you know some of the the groups Hurts me to do that, but I'm going to have to. They show up on my Facebook feed, and I read a lot of posts from some of these big gardening groups. On rare occasion, I'll dive in and yeah. comment. If it's a gardening group, not if it's a neighborhood group, because then you get, you know. Oh, the neighborhood groups, some of them. Chaotic mess there. Some of them are bare knuckles Facebook. <laughs> so if you don't have really thick skin, you don't want to join them and read them, and you definitely don't want to comment. Because people might not be really nice, and there's not a whole lot of moderation going on either. <laughs> but if you want to find out more about those classes, if you just go to, there we go. If we go to the name scrolling across the bottom here, HernandoExtension.com, all one word, HernandoExtension.com. We have a full listing of all of our upcoming classes. Teresa asked this morning if you have any, have you added classes to your oh, yeah, Facebook? She, she asked me that. Uh, everything that I have planned so far is in my events in Facebook. Okay. So Do we share it on ours? Because um, the, feed, usually, the feed only takes off of ours. I usually have you added as a participant, so it will show up on yours. Okay. I'll have Whether to, you are I'll actually check. participating or not. <laughs> <laughs> When I go and I notice it, I click OK or accept. Wow. Don't always go or notice well, it. Teresa's so. on it. She's looking at my events. She'll share them. I um, couldn't make it through the day without Teresa. No. So. Yes. I came um, a month or so ago. I've been holding ring barrel workshops here in your office. And Teresa wasn't here. And oh, no. <laughs> We couldn't find a HDMI cable to run my laptop. Oh my gosh. And Teresa wasn't here. And so I stole one directly out of his computer because he also wasn't here. So. Yeah, I have a couple stray ones in here now. I think I gave them to Teresa. So we have about <laughs> five in the office. We'll never be without HDMI cables again. And now that Corey's here, I guess we're all set. So, Corey, we've been here since 10. Well, PJ's not here yet. We haven't seen her. Okay. And Bonnie says that her mother used cinnamon to deter ants. Didn't she say that you did that? Yeah, it seemed to work. Yeah. You know, the sugar ants that come in your kitchen? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I use the um, taro ant Yeah, I killer. use that too. That is so much fun. I... <laughs> I can't. I wasn't going to say fun. I was going to say it works great. It but. does. And when way back in the trailer days, as you called them, uh -huh. when the county extension office was in a series of double whites where their nursery is now, way back in the trailer days, way back when we had sugar ants or pharaoh ants. And we used that tarot. 
and I don't know I, if I got any work done because <laughs> they were on my desk and I would use, it's like a, a gel and I'd put it like on a cardboard, a little piece of cardboard on my desk and they'd show up and they'd circle the dot. <laughs> Uh -huh. I'm eating it up. <laughs> I spend so much time watching them ingest <laughs> this stuff, and I, you know, would do that in my own kitchen too. <laughs> so maybe I've it's, got a little bit of serial killer in it me too. Does, it works <laughs> very well on ants that are looking for sugar. Yes. And most of the really tiny ones that you're going to get in your kitchen are looking for sugar, so it works very well on the indoor ones. Very safe to use. It's what is it? Borax. Uh, yeah, I don't that's know. very safe to use just a little drop on a little tiny piece of cardboard put it in the corner on your kitchen counter and the ants will smell it and find it and they all eat it and then they all disappear mm -hmm. for a couple weeks and then they come back they'll make a perfect circle <laughs> around the dot yeah. that you as they're slurping it up <laughs> yes yeah, so Corey, you have to uh, there's a lot of different baits yeah. out there. Yeah, the same thing works on ghost dance. I think they're a sweet, loving yeah. thing too. So with with baits, it's either giving them some kind of protein material or sugary material. And you have to figure out, is the ant I'm trying to get rid of, does he like eating protein stuff or sugary stuff? So if they want the sugary stuff, Tara works well. Protein, um, what's the... Um, What's the ant killer that you spread on your lawn in the little granules? Andro. Andro, yes. Andro is basically bacon bits impregnated with insecticide. Hopefully I didn't ruin your breakfast, but it's a very high protein material that has the insecticide in it. And Andro can actually go bad and go rancid. So if you have a bag of Andro that's been in your shed for five, 10 years, it's probably bad and the ants are gonna the ants don't want to eat rotten bacon nobody wants to eat rotten bacon right they want to eat nice fresh bacon so andro does not last forever but it is used outdoors because most of those outdoor ants are looking for the high protein food so grits are not going to work i've always heard the grits thing and i'm uh, that is generally been discounted and I, I honestly can't tell you if anybody's actually done the research or written the paper but well they, they don't chew for one thing so they don't these, chew these grits are not going to explode in their stomachs like people yeah say. yeah grits don't work yeah boiling and what it will do anything you put on their mound is going to alert them you know they'll attack it they'll bad, move it something bad is happening here let's move on mm -hmm. so you could be doing what i do with the bait is I play fire ant chess with my neighbor. Yep. <laughs> Your move. <laughs> uh -huh. Time to send it back to my side. <laughs> yep. You tend to move the outdoor ones around from yard to yard or space to space. You have to be diligent. Um, it really helps if you know what kind of ant you're dealing with other than ants or ants. Because we have a couple hundred different species of ants here in Florida. And they're not all bad. You know, there are some native ants that you want to encourage to be in your yard. That is one of the best deterrents of the invasive species, the fire ant, is already having a good population of our native, you know, just a regular black ants. Mm -hmm. So don't freak out every time you see an ant. You know, they're part of the ecosystem of your yard. Well, kind of yes or no. They Harvester ants are beneficial because they eat weed seeds and anything that eats weed seeds out in your yard is probably a pretty good thing well, they aerate the soil. i think with fire ants they found that other species of ants will dominate them and push them out unfortunately it's the um tawny crazy ant that does that and they are probably the worst ants that you could ever possibly have on your property I know of an area wow. here or two in Hernando County that have them. They make multiple queens. They make many, many mounds. They make um, nests and they just reproduce at an amazing rate. So people will have them on like the front wall of their house. I saw Do a they, gentleman. They bite, though, right? Go look in that bag right over there and you should find uh, a 
pretty good sized plastic jelly it's container. We're going to do a little show and tell here today. Uh, Tawny Crazy Ants are invasive and they came to Florida. They marched here. Yep, the, the one with the purple lid. The Welch's one? Yep. And they marched here from New Orleans. New Orleans has a huge problem with them and they moved through Alabama and through um, Was it like a funeral parade that they Kind of a funeral, them? well, not really a funeral parade, but they spread physically moving along and people do a fantastic job oh, of moving sure. them. People who they'll they will get in hay bales and hay the yeah. big cubes, mm -hmm. and then people will move them to the hay bale to their yard, and they just moved in a whole bunch of tawny crazy ants. So they reproduce at huge rates. So I had a gentleman call me. I went out and looked at his house, and he said, "I got them on the front wall around my front door of my house." I went out there and sprayed with rain first thing this morning, and I killed. This many of them. This is a Welch's jelly jar. Those are all ants. That's not dirt. No, these are all dead ants that he swept up to show me what they look like. And he said, I killed this many first thing this morning. I came back out after lunch and there were just as many of them back. So that you will end up with massive numbers of ants in your property. This is not dirt. Those are all ant bodies. They don't bite and they don't sting. So that's good. They're not like fire ants. They're not going to hurt you. They will get into your wiring, especially in your walls, your outside outlets. Mm -hmm. uh, they get into fuse boxes, boxes, power boxes, things like that. And they can, if you call your exterminator. Pool, pool pumps and wells. Sure, pool wells. pumps, wells, oh, everything. Yeah. We, we've had a, a uh, what is it, you know, the part that runs your well, um, if ants fried it so yeah yeah so it, so you need to check those things outdoors to make sure ants didn't get into it mm -hmm. but these ants really prefer those kind of spots and they will burn up boxes throw fuses cause a lot of physical damage that way and if you think that you're just going to call your pest control guy and have them come out and spray <laughs> they just laugh at that they're like well, <laughs> they're gone for maybe 15 minutes and then they come right back if University of Florida did the research on it, and Dr. Faith Oy, who specializes in different household pests, everything from ants to anything else you can get in your house, came up with a whole program. And if you have a problem with this, if you email me, uh, we'll send you a link to the information. There's a whole IPM program with all the different baits, pesticides, physical things, and everything else that you need to do in order to get them under control. They don't talk about getting rid of them. You're probably never gonna to be totally rid of them, but you can get them pretty well under control, but it's not easy. So guys, nobody wants these ants. There are worse things in the world than fire ants, believe it or not. Okay. We have a long, difficult question for Lily here. So I'll let her read it. Uh, Cindy has cuttings in water. Why does the water turn green in some of the containers, not all of them? And not often, but why does the water get a bad smell? I change the water regularly, just curious as to what makes the water turn green. Um, I don't know what kind of cuttings you have in the water. And yeah, it will turn sour. Um, depends on what you're trying to uh, propagate. And there are different schools of thought on that doesn't hurt really to put them in water, but the roots that you get in water, impatiens are like the classic thing people like to do that with. Um, the white roots you get from that, they're adventitious roots specifically to survive in the water. <laughs> That's what they put those out for. Mm -hmm. And you put them in the dirt and they'll shed those roots and start their soil roots. So people have the mistaken assumption that I rooted them in the water and those same roots then took off in the dirt. Whereas if you had skipped the water part, they probably would have started their soil roots in the dirt. Isn't that true? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, that is correct. Yes. Now my mother was a big um, proponent, you know, all the, the uh, inch plants is the new name for wandering Jew there. Spider plants, uh, um, 
in patients especially, yeah, you put them in that glass of water, let them get those white roots, and then you plant them, and it appeared successful, so, you know, mm -hmm. wasn't harmful, but you really didn't need to do that step. Um, you know, it depends on if it's the uh, wandering Jew that you have, if, if it's that purple queen, maybe it is some of the color leaching out, or I'm not sure why some would turn colors, but I do know if you keep it in there for a while, it does get sour smelling. That's just maybe the plant itself is starting to rot. So it's really time to get it out of the water and put it in the ground. Yeah, because the green is probably going to be algae that uh -huh. got in the water or was on the stem of the plant or in a tiny bit of soil or whatever it might be that you put in the water. And then the stinky stuff is bacteria. And same thing happens in cut flowers. If you got uh, yeah. somebody brings you roses or you get cut flowers, if you don't change the water in the vase frequently, it'll get bacteria and then it gets that bacterial ooze, which is the coating on the surface. And now, now I do, I did just do that because um, a couple, several weeks ago we went on vacation. Right before we went on vacation, I mean like the day before, a cousin of mine brought some house plant cuttings. It's that zigzaggy kind of plant yeah, um, yeah, yeah. for my sister who took a few of them on the trip home back to Pennsylvania with her, left me with a bunch. I had no time to do anything except leave it in that cup with the water rather than if I had taken them out, they would have died. So what it does is it, um, extends your time to keep that plant alive before you can plant it. But if um, if you're just waiting for those white roots to come along, there's no real need to do that. But like I said, in my situation, I was gone for a week and a half, had no time to plant them ahead of time. So I just left them in the water and yeah, the water smelled pretty <laughs> icky when I got back, but it kept them alive and now I just put them in pots. So we'll see, you know, what happens. And yes, they had those white roots <laughs> on them too. But I know once they're in the soil, they're going to get rid of those water roots and create um, soil roots. So, yes, they do. And many of those plants are very easy to root anyway if you just put them into uh, a sterile, quality, moist potting soil yeah. or rooting, and rooting you can soil. Even use some root tone if you want to, if that makes you feel better. Yeah, um, you know, which is a powdery thing that you can dip it in um, when you're propagating it. Yeah, and root tone helps. It never hurts. Right. So some plants really don't need root tone. Some plants, if you take it's a cutting and is. throw it on a sidewalk, it's going to root. Yes. <laughs> Other plants yes. are a lot tougher, and uh, root tone will actually help with the rooting. So it, it's helpful, but not necessary. So... We have a question here from Bonnie about where you can go to get information regarding pest control. And this is where you can go for that. So if you go online and you go to edis.ifas.ufl.edu, a little confusing, but not too hard. If you just Google ask IFAS, I-F-A-S, that will take you to the University of Florida website where they have all the different information, all the different fact sheets. And oh my gosh, we have oh, fact yeah. sheets on how to choose for everything. Yeah. Everything. Yeah, it's on there. IFAS, by the way, is the Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences. Yes, at it the is. University of Florida. In any other state that has a land grant university, they would call that the College of Agriculture. <laughs> University of Florida is fancier. It's the Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences. And that EDIS, all that means is Electronic Document Information System. This, but, you know, an easier way, like he said, ask IFAS or put in uh, professional, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, professional insect care and put UF or IFAS after that. And you will find, you will probably end up at an Ask IFAS site. So. 
hey, what happened to my Your what? email address is on here. I don't know. I lost I it know. last week. <laughs> oh! <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I let, you, I let you in here once and she starts tinkering and taking out emails and everything else yeah i had to write it in the comments because it was there and then it wasn't there <laughs> i guess i deleted it. you may have gone to the very top and picked a different i don't know mine's different still, brand mine's still there isn't that weird how i deleted yours and not mine <laughs> <laughs> It's W. Lester at UFL.edu. Okay. Well, if anybody has any really difficult questions, just email Lily because apparently she kept her email in here <laughs> and got rid of mine. That's okay. My forward button works. <laughs> okay. Just send the hard ones to Lily. So if you have a problem with Ew. huge amounts of ants or anything else. It's jelly ants. <laughs> <laughs> But no, obviously that's a lot of ants. So this this makes for a very good visual, visual aid here. Get by you. <laughs> They're just dead ants. Okay, let's turn that off. Let's turn that off. My head's starting to spin here. So, Bonnie said that she was told honey is a good root hormone. Good source of sugar. Mm -hmm. It's going to be good for the bacteria in the soil. I'm sure it doesn't hurt anything. I can't say for sure because I've never read any research one way or the other about whether it definitely works or not. But if, if it works for you, definitely doesn't hurt anything. Yeah. Yeah. And um, your plant won't have any allergies then either. <laughs> Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, hey, if you have any other questions, please feel free to put them in the comments. And we have a little bit of time here left. So if you have any getting close to last minute questions, you know, I would put my email up on the page here, but apparently it's gone now. So, so, um, what should what do we say to people? I mean, it's going to be it's getting so warm, and they want to go out and they want to cut down all the dead stuff in their yard. Should they do that yet? Sure. If you go ahead and do that, you need to be sure to go and visit our master gardener nursery to load up on new either native or Florida friendly plants to replace everything that you just cut down and dug out and pulled out that might have frozen. It's not quite time though yet. We could still have another. Yeah, you know, technically it's not time. Um, <laughs> technically it's not time. We've only got what, maybe a week until March 1st. And March 15th is the traditional date, but we have had frosts and freezes at the beginning of April. So, you, I mean, you can do it and we can't stop you and you're going to want to do it because it's so beautiful out. It feels like spring. It feels like you should be putting all this wonderful new stuff in your yard. Um, just be aware that you are still playing with fate. I planted pole beans in my vegetable garden last week when I was on vacation. There's an idea. What should we be doing in our vegetable garden right now? Okay, well, planting pole beans is technically a little early because if we do get a freeze, they're gonna. It's, it's going to be tough to keep them from dying. Hopefully, you have lots of nice, large, healthy transplants for tomatoes and peppers and hot peppers and eggplants hopefully bigger than mine i'm a little bit behind on schedule like i usually am they can go in the ground anywhere between the beginning of march and march 15th whenever you feel we're not going to have more freezes beans can once again go in about anywhere between march 1st and march 15th whenever you feel it's safe our south florida folks are probably pretty safe oh south florida folks are harvesting beans that were planted a couple months ago okay so if now you buddy, go to a farmer's buddy market, may not be safe yet to do yeah, that. Buddy's going to wait a little bit longer before he puts his beans in. So this depends on exactly where you live. Um, but then all those other warm season things in the near future, you could put in sweet potatoes. You can either buy the little tiny slips or plants online. You can get a sweet potato and put it in a jar of water and make a send up sprouts, carve them off and plant them. Both work um what else 
watermelons, cantaloupe, summer squash, winter squash, cucumbers, they are all really tough. They are all little disease magnets. If you don't know how to identify and look for diseases, and if you don't have a couple of quality fungicides handy, they're not gonna get too far. You need to get them in really early. So you need to be daring and plant them now and hope it doesn't freeze again. Otherwise, especially with cucumbers and summer squash, what happens is we get a little moth here called the pickle worm. Every year, the pickle worm gets killed off all the way down to South Florida. South Florida, I think they're around year round. They never get totally killed off in the, down in the Homestead, Miami area. In the spring, when it warms up, they move north. They keep moving north. They get here to Hernando County in April or May, generally. And what it is, it's a little moth that lays eggs on your cucumber and summer squash plants. And the little caterpillar drills a hole into the fruit. So if you're growing cucumbers and you pick one, it has a hole and a little stuff is kicked out. That's called frass. That's insect poop. Mm -hmm. And there's a caterpillar in your cucumber now and nobody wants that. That They're really, really hard to avoid and control. So you want to try to grow your cucumbers and summer squash before they get here. Now, they'll keep moving north uh, as the summer progresses, and they'll eventually get up to Buddy in the Panhandle. They get as far north as, like, North Carolina by the end of summer. Once again, cold weather comes, kills them all the way back to southern Florida, and it starts over again. So neem oil isn't going to work with them. Everybody loves neem, and they love it on Facebook, but neem... They just laugh at that. They're sitting inside the cucumber, waving and laughing at you. Why do they call pickle worms? Because you can't make pickles at once those worms come. <laughs> well, probably because pickles are made from cucumbers, but you well, can get I them. No, but you're not going to get that far if you have. <laughs> you won't. If you have so, this worm. So if you try growing cucumbers or zucchini or yellow squash, and there's another species that attacks harder things like cantaloupes, watermelons, winter squash. If you try growing them too late, pushing in the late spring, early summer, these guys will put an end to your plants. So don't try growing cucumbers during the heat of summer. You did it up north, you can't do it here in Florida. And or, yeah, or the zucchinis in the summer. That's the, the biggest mistake people make is they're so used to like planning their garden, starting it around Memorial Day. No, not here. The sweet potatoes he mentioned, yeah. And- Okra. Okra, black eyed peas, and some, and some of your tropical. Sure, there's a variety of different tropical vegetables. I, we need, I need to do a class on that. Just all the, I'll make up a list of all the oddball tropical vegetables and then because University of Florida is always looking at new ones that commercial growers could use. You still want to try that jackfruit, you said. Yeah, I've still never tasted jackfruit to see what it's like. Yeah, we're guys. We're too far north to grow jackfruit here. You can experiment with it, but <laughs> unless global warming really <laughs> kicks it up a few notches, it's not going to do really well here. So Lee, Lee lives you. down in Broward County. And she's already gotten five pounds of pole beans already. Yeah, you're you're ahead of us on the schedule, basically. Cool. Um, and yeah, definitely send me pictures of the garden. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm, I just lost what I was going to say. It's gone. Okay. <laughs> oh, you have a spring gardening class coming up. That's what it is. I do. Don't you and Norma? Oh yeah, yeah we do. We have a, we have a lot of stuff coming up. Well, when, what day is that? That's next Friday. Okay, <laughs> not tomorrow, the following Friday, right? Correct, not tomorrow, but the following Friday. So, let me double check here. Next Friday, March 4th, we are going to start our Food Systems in Season series of classes once again. And this is gonna be on YouTube Live. So any of you that are watching us on YouTube Live, it'll work just like we're doing right now. For anybody watching us through Facebook, you just have to go to the link on YouTube and it's gonna work basically the same way. We have, um, it's a whole series, it's a five part series. So it goes 
March 4th, March 11th, March 18th, March 25th, and then April 1st is going to be our last one. And we're going to have different guests on there talking about food systems. The first one's going to have Norma Samuel from Sumter County Extension, and she'll be talking about spring vegetable gardening. And she will even go live out in her garden with her phone. And if any of you saw it last time, she did great. She just went charged out there with her phone and showed everything going on in her garden to give you ideas of what you could do with your garden. So other people, oh, we're going to talk about canning. We're going to talk about um, goats. We're going to talk about, I can't remember what else we're going to talk about, but it's going to be great. We have a lot of different topics over those five weeks. So <clears throat> be sure to tune in. Uh, before we leave, I'll throw the banner down once again about where to go, HernandoExtension.com. You should have that memorized by now. If you go there, you're going to see all those classes and all the other classes that we have coming up. And mine, <clears throat> because Teresa's going to put them And on Lily's, there. yes, <laughs> because we're going to be, make sure they're shared on our Facebook and they'll show up. But Verna, Verna, I think, is a new listener yeah. here. And Verna, welcome, has a question about oak trees. So Verna has quite a few oak trees in her backyard. So the only area that gets part sun at different times throughout the day. Are there any fruit trees that would do well planted amongst the oak trees? Yes and no. Most fruit trees that you would think of as fruit trees, like let's say loquat, peaches, plums, nectarines. Um, what other kind of fruit trees can you fruit, go here? Fruit, fruit, Citrus. Yeah. Mo all of them like full sun. There are you would want to look for an understory tree. And the one thing that I can think of off the top of my head that would probably do very well because it is an understory tree out in the woods here. It's native it's to Chickasaw Central Florida. Plum. It's the Chickasaw plum. So if you go for a hike in the woods sometimes, you'll see them. And they only get, what's the biggest one you've ever seen? Maybe, I don't know, 15, yeah. maybe 20 feet tall. Mm -hmm. So they don't get to be huge trees, but they're growing in the woods underneath all the big oak trees and pine trees <clears throat> so they're well adapted to that speckled sun partial shade chickasaw plums do great in full sun but they do pretty good in partial sun mulberries too as long as you don't get the paper mulberry the invasive type yeah the mulberries, mulberries are kind of the new trendy thing they, they are, shade. Yeah. and I'm no expert on the different varieties. You don't want the paper white no, because no, that's no. horribly invasive, and you will regret it for the rest of your mm -hmm. life. I've gotten <laughs> emails from people, how do I get rid of them? And you know they use a lot of herbicide. In the shade, and I'm not sure how well, but I've seen them growing in the shade, kind of almost wild, um, tangerines. Citrus and tangerines can. They tend to get really leggy in the shade. So they can survive as an understory tree, mm -hmm. but don't necessarily thrive. Chickasaw plums uh, survive gonna, and you're... thrive a little bit better because they do that normally out in the forest. Right, but you will have to be out there ahead of the birds and stuff. Yeah, yeah, animals are gonna find those plums. And you can can the plums if you use a ton of sugar. They come out very tasty, but they're naturally uh, a little bit on the sour hey, side. Beauty berry. Beauty, beauty berry. Is edible, beauty berry is a very grow good choice. On, in the shade, like like a weed. And it's edible, like Bill said, with a whole lot of sugar. <laughs> the berries are, are edible. It is quite warm. It's going to get up in the 80s. I think Corey said last week that that's garbage. And I agree, <laughs> I agree with him. It's too warm too fast. And Corey tried 72 jackfruit and they all died. Sorry, Corey. Well, it happens. He's in northern Pasco. So yeah. he's not far enough down. Yeah. And if the jackfruit, if the trees had gotten bigger, it probably would have died back some, but come back. Uh, if you have one mile winter, it's probably going to get to produce fruit yeah you know the winter weather here is really erratic we'll have a couple warm fairly warm winters 
It's funny because we'll have a warm winter with one freeze, and that one night we'll get down to 27 in my yard. Yeah. And if you don't have things planted in the right spot or covered or protected or whatever it might be, maybe you lose it just because of that one night out of the year. We're in that difficult, difficult stage right now where it is so warm, so sunny, and but yet we still have evidence that we had a freeze. So our mind can't quite handle these everything brown in our yard while it's so beautiful outside. So that's why we're gonna be in a hurry to wanna change that. But you know, most things are gonna come back. So, you know, don't rush too fast. Yeah. Yeah, and the paper mulberries will come back. <laughs> Like Monique, it sounds like Monique has an issue with them. Yeah, I know. Um, I know others who are. Get other mulberry, the black and the red. Mm -hmm. Just don't get the, the paper. Mulberries, like I said, are the trending thing. They're the new acai, you know. Yeah. And yeah, what's yeah. interesting though about them is they, you can't go somewhere and buy mulberries. They don't pack well. They don't travel well. They turn to mush. So the only way that you can really have mulberries is to have the tree yourself. Blackberries too. Blackberries are you can find them at the store, but they're really expensive. Well, you better eat them that because they don't they don't ship well. I at have found all. that and raspberries too. You better yeah. eat raspberries that day. That you get so them. if you attended our blackberry class a few months ago, you went home with three plants, so you should be okay with blackberries. <laughs> um, but they don't even try. With mulberries like they do no berries and raspberries mulberries are okay you they're not really sweet mulberry jam and things like that especially yeah. in country stores or yeah. whatever but yeah. lee you are always very welcome be sure to keep an eye out for those red caterpillars if you find any more if you can get a hold of me we're going to have ask you to ship them to me so we can find out for sure what they are, make sure it's not some kind of nasty invasive. There's always that possibility. Yeah. And going back to tangerines, Corey has a few seeds that grew accidentally. Uh, the sour citrus. Sour citrus is used as a root stock. So sometimes with very, very old trees that froze back and died years ago and grew back from the roots, it's no longer a whatever it was. It's now that sour citrus. That makes a very good marinade mm -hmm. for Spanish and food. Marmalade and uh -huh. the yeah, the old um, old Floridians knew what to do with it as well. I wonder what it would be I, like I in a margarita. See, uh, I don't know. Okay. To try it. Okay. Anybody ever try a sour orange margarita what are doing, or what are we doing after this? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any sour oranges. So I mean a lot of people think that, oh well, if I cut it and try eating it like a regular orange, ah, oh, it's really yeah. sour and they are really sour. Yeah. But there are things that you could do with it. Right? And I've seen citrus, you know, um, grow where no one put it. <laughs> um, and I don't, I don't see PJ on today um, from Marion County, but um, I have seen, and they have a problem in the Ocala National Forest with citrus actually being an invasive. It can, you know, it can, it doesn't spread very, very quickly. Yeah, well, but if you go on a hike, they're unmanaged for many yeah, years. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, up at Shinsega Manor House here, if you go stomping through the woods around there, you'll find a few random sure. citrus trees oh, yeah. left over mm -hmm. from a hundred years ago when they there had citrus groves. Um, in the Green Swamp, there's a site of an old homestead. Um, some people may be aware of it. Uh, probably shouldn't even say this, but the uh, the um, old woman who was at the homestead, her and her husband were murdered there in 1918. Oh no. She is my husband's great, great grandmother. But anyway, um, we visited that site several times. And so I see Sally's citrus trees and Sally's mulberry trees that are still yeah, yeah. around that site. So it's kind of. They'll find roses and azaleas and other plants that were brought in at those old home sites mm -hmm. and obviously if you have a rose bush that's been growing there with no maintenance for a hundred years and still if it looks good 
that's a keeper. That's one you want to yes. take a cutting off of because yes. that's obviously well adapted to the conditions. Mm -hmm. Or it might be like in um, Sleeping Beauty. The prince had to get through all that whole, all those brambles and roses and stuff. <laughs> and one last question here. Verna asks, is citrus greening still a big problem? Yes. Yes, it <laughs> is. As a matter of fact, Good. yes. But it's not without hope. They're trying. You know, the university and researchers, they're working on it. They have a few resistant varieties now. Sugar Bell is one, and it's a mandarin orange. Good luck finding a tree. There are nurse, there's plenty of nurseries growing it, but obviously demand for it from commercial growers wanting to buy 10,000 trees at a time is kind of sucking up the supply. But if you start looking long and hard on Google, you may be able to find a nursery where you can get one at. So a Sugar Bell, B-E-L-L-E, and that is a greening resistant variety. It's not a GMO. So don't flip out. It's not a GMO. Uh, but it will get citrus greening, but it will not show symptoms. It will not decline. And it will continue producing normal crops of good tasting fruit. It's supposed to be a really tasty fruit. And those types of mandarins can grow well north of here. They take. Aren't uh, mandarins tangerines? Mandarins are a type of tangerine, or tangerine is a type of mandarin, I think, technically. Uh -huh. When you buy but, a canned mandarin, it's just it's tangerine, isn't it? It is, but it's a certain type. Okay. So, because there's different name types of tangerines, pumpkin, tangerine, and a couple of others. But they will grow all the way up into the panhandle mm -hmm. and up to the very northern edge of Florida. So they take cold weather. A little baby plant's going to freeze and die a lot easier than one that's a couple years old and healthy and mature and is, you know, flourishing and everything. So there is hope in sight for being able to grow citrus without worrying about greening. I love their name. What? Sugar Bell? Sugar Bells. I'm Sugar Bell, yep. Sugar Bell. And they have at least one variety of lemon and one variety of grapefruit. But I don't know the names of those and they're not available just yet. So... I need to have a class on yeah, citrus. You should. It's been a long time. You know, <laughs> they were going to send me, at first, they were looking for extension agents who wanted 10 sugar bell trees to try growing and then send information back to them. And that was about a year and a half ago. And I'm instantly like, yes, count me in. And I told Jim, I said, we're getting 10 citrus trees. Where are we going to plant them? And we thought the new government building. Well, this is even before they moved there, so we didn't know where we were going to put them. I'd put them out in the front yard here if I had to. We'd plant them somewhere. Um, but then it got delayed, got delayed, got delayed. They sent it back. And they said, we can only send you three trees. Got delayed. And then they, the last email I got was, we made arrangements and they're shipping them. You should get them next Monday. And I swear that was six months ago. I haven't heard anything. You know what it could be? It could actually be... Uh staffing problem with the workers and the nurseries and all that with covid and all that I mean, who knows supply and demand. i think there was yeah. just no supply right. of them um, and that was somebody with well, maybe one with day. the university of florida maybe like three years from now you'll get your trees yeah. <laughs> just out of one nowhere. day right. one day we're going to get a box from ups and it's going to be citrus trees be so trust me we will document that and take lots of pictures video everything if I actually have some citrus to play with, we could do a lot yeah. with that. Yeah. If they ever send it to me, and we may be waiting for a long time. They may be available at Lowe's and Home Depot and Walmart before they send me mine. <laughs> well, it's after 11, Bill. Yes, it is. So very quickly, Bonnie says her husband was in a client's home, and she had a white grapefruit tree. Cool. They're still around. They don't. Grapefruits weathered the storm better than anything else i think yeah and there's this line of thinking that if you have a citrus tree in your yard and your neighbors don't and you don't live anywhere near a commercial citrus grove like more than 20 miles away from one chances of you getting infected citrus psyllids which is the insect that spreads the disease is pretty low so yours was quarantined basically yeah so if yours lives in covid think of it as covid quarantine for your citrus 
if it lives alone and doesn't see anybody else, then and doesn't see any of those nasty insects that bring the disease, it's safe. Oh. But no guarantee. You could plant a citrus tree and it might have greening within a week. Another thing that might help um, is putting compost down around your your citrus tree. That they're finding that out professionally. That I don't know the science behind it or what it does, but it does the this fruit stays green but it gets bigger so it's at least juiceable and just with simple compost around the bottom of the tree yeah and perfect management helps perfect fertilization helps perfect irrigation helps there's a bunch of different things that all help a little bit and when you do all of them you're going to have a really healthy citrus tree that's going to be able to withstand insect and disease pressure but if you live near commercial citrus and you have a citrus tree and it gets the psyllids and gets greening there's still no cure for greening nothing you can spray on it that's going to make it go away and nothing you can do to make it stop since your citrus tree keeps going the, on the you know the days of florida being known for citrus they're over we're, we're in the well it still is and it's i mean between greening and development right I mean, down South Florida, you know, well, around Orlando, what happened to all the groves? They're subdivisions. Yes, they are. And, and a lot of that has to do with, you know, the freezes in the 80s and then the greening. And you have someone who owns the citrus grove. You know, they're a private citrus grove owner, just like any other farmer out there. They worked for themselves. That land is their retirement. They don't have, they didn't put in the Social Security. So you can't really blame them for selling, you know, to developers. And it's just how for top dollar. Yeah, so, how things are changing in yeah. the state. But yeah, I'll plan on doing something with citrus. It's been a while. Um, yeah. University of Florida has plenty of experts that can help me out. So okay. I'll plan on doing a class. Okay, you do that. Okay. Well, guys, I think we need to wrap it up for today. So thank you so much for joining us. And. Lily, I haven't told you yet, but next week I have to go to a conference in Gainesville. So <laughs> next week, join us once again for Lily, the Lily Show. I think of someone who wants to come on with me. Sure, we'll, we'll, we'll find somebody. <laughs> so everybody, thank you so much for tuning in. And thank you so much for tuning in every week and following us. This is great fun for us. It's something that we do our very, very, very best to never miss a Thursday. And generally between the two of us, we got them pretty well covered. Mm -hmm. And be sure to come back and see Lily and her guest next Thursday what morning. What is next Thursday? What is that date? Um, <laughs> I don't know. Um, next Thursday is going to be March 3rd. And I will be at a food conference in Gainesville presenting a poster. Okay. And I may be able to sneak into a different room and join. Right. I can watch on my phone. I can comment I on my phone. I don't think I have anything else. I'll ask really hard questions on my phone. And you need to plan on coming back and doing it with Bernie because Monique says Bernie was great. Okay, so, well, he's just so in the other room, actually. I'll go ask him <laughs> right as soon as we're done. Tell that Bernie has his fan base now. He does. So. He does. <laughs> he's a great guy. He is. He, he's very, very knowledgeable, and he answers a lot of questions here at the office. As a matter of fact, he should be in there keying out to species uh, termite. Not everybody can do that. Okay, well, thanks again, everybody, and we will see you again next week. Until then, everybody take care. Yeah, Bye. We'll see you.